Hello, and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that have helped them become more real to us, because we believe that allows us to draw more power out of them, and we need all the help we can get. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and I'm so happy to have with me uh, a friend of mine and a colleague here in our uh, college, and his office is just down the hall from mine. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Mike Goodman. Uh, hi, Mike. Hey, Kerry. How are you? I'm good. I'm so glad you'd spend time to be with us. So uh, let me tell you all just a little bit about uh, Dr. Goodman, and then we'll let him tell you more about himself, and he'll correct whatever false doctrine I've uh, preached or anything else. Um, uh, I don't actually know where you're from, Mike, so you'll have to tell us that. But uh, but he I ended up getting a, a, a bachelor's in journalism and public relations and a master's degree in information technology and a Ph.D. in marriage and family and human development. And that's uh, what I know him for. He's always involved in all sorts of great studies, helping us understand families and and youth. He's involved in what's called the Family Foundations of Youth Development Longitudinal Research Project. But anyway, there uh, it helps us understand all sorts of uh, things about how uh, religion uh, affects families and youth. And I think that's really, really powerful. He also teaches uh, uh, missionary prep. He's been a mission president. He's a convert to the church. Uh, uh, like I think at this point, like a 12 time cancer survivor, um, <laughs> something along those lines. Uh, yeah. and we hope that, uh, that he, uh, just keeps beating whatever comes his way. But, uh, I'm sure I've left out the most important stuff about your wife and your children. So we'll let <laughs> you tell us all that. Why don't you, you tell us what you're up to Mike and a little bit about yourself. You bet. So I, as you can tell from my academic, academic background, I'm somewhat of a mutt. I've got an associate's <laughs> in business, a bachelor's in journalism, a master's in IT, and a PhD in marriage and family, and I teach religion. Um, and so, a uh, jack of many trades, a uh, master of few. Um, <laughs> my my academic work largely focuses on uh, the social science behind how uh, young adults and adolescents thrive. Um, I'm part of a uh, what might be the largest longitudinal study in the nation on adolescent well-being, looking at every aspect of health and wellness and risk behaviors and spirituality and 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 these things. And so we're actively working. Uh, and we're about in our eighth year of this study, trying to trying to figure out what what from a scientific perspective helps uh, people to thrive. So that's that's kind of the academic stuff. Um, I am a four-time cancer survivor, not quite 12. Well, actually, I'm a three-time cancer survivor. I currently have leukemia, and they don't have a cure for it, but I'm still here, and so life is good. Uh, we're working through that. Um, I'm married to heaven. Her name is Tina. Uh, we've been mm -hmm. married for 38 years. Uh, we have two children we adopted, uh, our son and daughter. Our son has three daughters. Our daughter has three sons. We plan that, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's so, that's pretty good. There you go. And so, yeah, I, I, I served as a mission president uh, 27, I didn't talk. Years, 27 years ago in Thailand. Uh, yeah. Uh, so a long time ago, I'm an old man. Um, and I didn't talk about how you used to work for seminaries and institute and uh, you were a curriculum writer for them and so on, right? That's right. That's right. So anyway, gospel's true. I'm grateful to have a chance to teach it on a daily basis and glad to be with you today, Carrie. Well, thank you for being with us. Um, and I know that uh, for you, Mike, I mean, this is uh, the week where we're talking about just the Book of Mormon in general and the power of the Book of Mormon and and uh, getting ready for this Book of Mormon year that I hope we're all so excited for. I'm really excited. Uh, I love every book of scripture. And, and obviously, I spent a lot of time in the Old Testament, but I really love the Book of Mormon and think there's something very special and powerful about that book. So this is the the week we're going to talk about that in general. And I know that the Book of Mormon has uh, played a, a powerful role in your life. So I uh, would love to hear about the, the power of the Book of Mormon in your life, how it's become real for you and, and what it's done for you and wherever else we may go. Wonderful. I, I might just add right in the beginning that Carrie's love of the Book of Mormon has blessed my life because I love teaching the Pearl Great Price. And the few times I am allowed to do so, because I'm on the other side of the, the aisle, church history and doctrine instead of ancient scripture, is when Carrie says, you know what? I want to teach the Book of Mormon. And it frees up a slot. They say, okay, Mike, you can go have your time. <laughs> so anyway. Carrie's it is true. I, I think maybe that's uh, worth saying. Like I uh, typically I'm slotted for Isaiah or Old Testament or uh, 
Christ and the everlasting gospel. But I feel like for my own spiritual health and my intellectual health and understanding all the rest of scripture, I really can't go too many years with that teaching Book of Mormon. So about every five years or so, I say, I, I know you have other people who want to teach Book of Mormon, but I, I need that slot. And yeah. Yeah. they're kind enough to give it to me. So yeah. wonderful. So so I guess just to, to back it up a little bit and give you a little bit of my personal uh why I find the Book of Mormon so powerful. Um, I, I, when I was 17, 18 years old, was a young man, not in the church in any way, shape or form, raised by wonderful, wonderful alcoholic parents, uh, taught me to love Jesus um, and taught me to love the Bible um, and tried to help me figure out how to do life. When I was about 17, I had a girlfriend, oh, the classic story. She was not Latter a Latter Day Saint, she was investigating, and mm -hmm. I, being an active born again Christian and knowing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints was a cult, my thought at the time, I decided I had to save her soul, and so I decided to take the missionary discussions with her, not because I was trying to figure out if the church was true, but because I wanted to prove it false um, and save my girlfriend. Right. Well, mm. that began a very long journey. Uh, I ended up with about 10 sets of missionaries in almost a year. Um, but the book of Mormon is going to end up playing, uh, the, the key role in this process for, for months, probably five, six months, and at least three or four sets of missionaries. They did what all good missionaries should do. They tried to get me to read the book of Mormon. Um, but I wouldn't do it. I, I'm not exactly sure why, as I look back, I, I think I kind of feared that if I read it, I'd become like a, a Mormon zombie. Uh, and <laughs> I, I don't I don't know what it was, but I wouldn't read it. Uh, when they came and taught me, I would read the verses they'd ask, but they'd always ask me to read after I got, they left and, and I never did it. Um, they actually, <laughs> I don't know how they actually bribed me into once reading one chapter because I had a, I had a massive interest in what happens after you die. And they said, oh, we've got a chapter for you. And they pointed me to Alma 40. Mm -hmm. um, and so I read I read that. That was probably the only chapter of uh, Book of Mormon that I ever read um, before, uh, before they dumped me. I'll explain that in a sec. Um, but I read it. But I read it with the mindset of, I know this is false, but I'll do it just to humor them. Not your best way of building faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or anything else. And so I read it. They came back. They were so excited because they knew that I'd read it. Um, and they said, what do you think? Um, and I said, I don't know. I didn't get much out of it. And oh, I could just, I still see their eyes. They were just so crestfallen. Uh, <laughs> but they they simply, they kept trying and I kept refusing. Till about six months into this process, uh, the sister You're mission. About 18 now or something like yeah, that. I'm, I'm 17, 18, right in that birthday period there. Right. Uh, the the sisters came back one day and they were teaching my girlfriend and I, who she had a complete testimony, wanted to get baptized, but her family wouldn't let her. Her parents wouldn't let her. She was still 17. Um, and so they came back and they said, Brother Goodman, which by the way, I always thought was kind of fun because they're calling me Brother Goodman. I'm a 17 year old kid. And, yeah. and just to give you the visual, I, I had hair down to about here and I had a full mustache. I definitely did not look like uh, BYU religion prof. I'll just put it that way. Um, but they, um, <laughs> they said, brother Goodman, you need to read the book of Mormon. If you're going to know what we're saying is true. And, and I'd say, sisters, I, I listened to every discussion. And by the way, they taught me the discussions through by that time, at least twice, if not three times, all the way, all the discussions, they made up discussions for me because I'd have <laughs> questions and they'd come but I just said, sisters, I, I just can't do it. And they, they said, but but if you don't do it, you'll never know if what we're saying is true. And I said, but I'm, I pray, I pray like a wild man. And I did, I, I was sincere. It was the real intent part that was problematic. You mm -hmm. remember we're on I-10, three through five. Yeah. Faith in Christ, sincerity, real intent. Well, I most definitely did not intend to move forward if I got that answer. Because I knew I wouldn't get the answer, right? And so they... <laughs> they gently but politely said, well, we've done all we can do and, and there's nothing more we'll, we'll be able to do to, to help you. Lord bless you. Have a good life. And they dumped me. Mm. I was spitting mad. I mean, I was polite to them, sweet sisters. Um, 
by the way, I was taught by sisters because when they'd send elders, man, could I argue well. The sisters, I could disagree, but it had to be nice. Um, and so what happened was they left. And I was stewing. I was so mad. And I thought, no, y- you can't dump me. I dump you. I- I'm the one who's studying, right? And yeah. Next next day, I'm sitting on my couch, just still, I was hurt. I was, I was, yeah, whatever it was. I was, I was not happy. Yeah. Um, but I got it in my mind. Okay, fine. I'm going to, I'm going to prove this book is false. And so I went over and I grabbed the Book of Mormon they gave me. Now, this is going to date me. It's one of those light blue ones with the gold Moroni on it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you remember those? So mm-hmm. I picked it up and I probably shook the dust off because I hadn't touched it for too long. And I picked it up with the intent to prove the book false. Again, not your greatest motivation. But I opened it up to what I now know as the the, the title page. Um, but... <laughs> They they had they had highlighted or underlined certain portions, and then they wrote on the bottom of the page, go to page 16. Now, unbeknownst to them, I have non-clinical OCD, meaning I'm not on medication, I have not been diagnosed, but they couldn't have set a better trap if they tried. Because once I saw that. I had to, I had to follow it. Um, literally, I, I drove to Salt Lake for three years as the manager of college curriculum for the church. I read every billboard on the way up, every billboard on the way back, and I did that every day for three years. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea. I'm, I'm a little bit obsessive when it comes to, oh, there's something to read. I need to see what this says. So I read the little underlined things, go to page 16. I went to page 16, and sure enough, They'd underlined a few more things and then go to page 28. I don't know what the pages were. Um, come to find out this actually has a name. It's called the Lanny Owens technique. I have no, no clue who Lanny is, but Lord bless his soul. So I was trapped because remember, I was trying to read this to disprove it. But all of a sudden, I'm going for a tour of the Book of Mormon. And I went to the next one and they highlighted some things and go to page 58 or whatever. And, and I just... I'm going through this tour and like after 10 minutes of this, I'm, yeah, I started kind of angry. You know, I'm going to prove this false. After 10 minutes, I'm confused because what I'm reading didn't seem evil. <laughs> mm. I know that sounds like a really low uh, hurdle to get over, but I thought, <laughs> man, this is kind of similar to what I've read in the Bible. I had been a regular Bible reader since a very powerful, miraculous spiritual experience I had back in the fourth and fifth grade. So I I was a believer. I knew my, one of the problems with the Latter-day Saint missionaries, I say that as a past mission president and a current MTC branch president, our missionaries don't know the Bible very well. Yeah, yep. <laughs> and so yeah, I- my, my daughter's in Iowa and when she got her call, we're like, hey, we need to work on this whole Bible stuff for you. <laughs> exactly right. So I, I could almost always out argue the missionaries when it came to Bible stuff, because they just didn't know it. Well, as I read this first 10 minutes, I'm thinking, boy, this is confusing. It, it kind of feels good. And so I just kept reading. Uh, And after about 10 more minutes, it took about 30 minutes to get through this whole thing. But after about 10 more minutes, I'm starting to actually experience wonder because I'm, I, I didn't know enough about this is what the Holy spirit feels like or anything like that. But I started to sense that, This was not only not evil, there was something here. And so I kept reading and it took me about a half hour to finish all their trap. Um, When I finished it, I remember this. I remember sitting in my my family living room. I don't know why, but my girlfriend was at my house. That's not strange. She She was doing dishes or something. I have no idea why. But anyway, I slammed the book and I yelled it yelled towards my my girlfriend i said call the sister missionaries back i want to keep studying Hmm. she turned to me and you know what she said she said they're not coming back they dumped you (laughs) and i thought rude (laughs) so i went over and i grabbed a pamphlet because they you know back in the day they they used pamphlets a lot somehow i found their phone number and so I went over the phone myself and I 
called. It was on a Saturday afternoon. How I got them at home, I have no idea. But they answered. Hello? Sisters, come back. Total silence on the other end of the phone. Um, who's this? <laughs> oh, uh, this is Mike. That's me. This is yeah. Mike. I want you to come back. Total silence on the other end of the phone. Um, who's Mike? Uh, who's Mike? You've been in my home weekly, regular. Oh, you didn't call me Mike. You called me Brother Goodman. Sisters, this is Brother Goodman. Brother Goodman, what's wrong? I read it. What'd you read? The Book of Mormon. And I want you to come back. I think I almost shocked them to the point of fainting, but they said, okay. So they came back and they started, they taught me again. They started from the beginning. Uh, the first discussion, they, they taught me through it. But this time I was reading the book. Hmm. I was reading the book of Mormon and it changed everything within a month and a half, two months. I knew, oh no, within a month, I knew this book was true. I knew it was good. I knew it would bring me closer to Christ. Um, I wanted to get baptized. <laughs> so I went to my mom and I said, mom, I want to be baptized. And, and she says, oh, but honey, you just started studying. Mom, I'm like eight months into this process. They, yeah. She said, okay, if you want to get baptized, study for three more months. Why she said that, I have no idea. Three more months. And if you want to be baptized, I'll come to your baptism. And I said, done. I, I'm, I'm sure it broke the sister's heart because they knew I was ready, but I studied for three more months and ended up with my mom coming to my baptism. Mm. Now, what's my point? Why, why, am I, why am I sharing this? I don't in any way, shape, or form believe that the Book of Mormon is magic, nor do I believe that everyone who reads it will have that powerful experience that I did. In fact, I know they won't. After I was baptized and for the next... 13, 14 years, I tried to get my family to read it. Um, and I remember my dad, I always thought my dad was an atheist. But I remember right before I went out to serve as a mission president, I was 32, 33 years old. And I was talking to my dad and my dad said, Mike, I'm not an atheist. I believe in Christ. You could have pulled me over with a favor. Of that. No way. <laughs> You've never gone to church. You've never talked about God. And he said, he said, Mike, I read my Bible all the time. I'm going, where? I had never seen this before. <laughs> and he, then he said this, I haven't tried to read your Book of Mormon. I just couldn't get through it. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I'm not saying that everyone who reads it is going to have this experience. But I'll say this. The Book of Mormon is the tool that the Lord has given us to help people come to know the reality of the restored gospel. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, so I serve right now in the MTC as a branch president. The MTC has three focuses that we go through. We just go round, round. We just go round and round and round. Week one, this focus, two, this focus, three, this focus. And then the next week goes back to uh, the first one. One of the three focuses that we teach every single week to all of our missionaries is the power of the Book of Mormon and deepening their conversion of Christ through the Book of Mormon. So that is that is every every three weeks, every missionary in the MTC is that's their focus. Um, and in fact, I, I came to know <laughs> I taught mission prep for a lot of years, uh, you know, what, 32, 33 years or so. Um, and you're old. I'm an old man, I'm telling you. So <laughs> um when when I have a student or I have someone come to me and say, Brother Goodman, what's the best thing I can do to prepare for a mission? I had a pat answer. It was it was awesome until Elder Bednar blew it up. But my pat answer was this. Read the Book of Mormon like your life depends on it. You need to you need to come to a powerful testimony of the veracity, the reality of this book being the word of God, if you're going to help others do it. Now, Elder Bednar blew that up because he taught 
very openly, the best way to prepare to be a missionary is to be a missionary now. And I thought, okay, you win. I'm second. Um, but the <laughs> Book of Mormon has great power to help people. What I would, if I could put it into to my own emphasis, it's got great power to help people enter into the covenant mm -hmm. with Christ. And so there's great power for missionaries. There's great power for those we used to call them investigators. We don't do that anymore. We call them our friends, which is which is good. Um, but there's great power to help people go from not knowing the reality of or the truth of the the restored gospel to knowing it. And so there's there's real power in that. But that's not it's not enough. <laughs> uh, I I remember a talk. In fact, I, uh, stay with me. I remember a talk that President Nelson gave once in which he said this, whenever I hear anyone, including myself, say, I know the Book of Mormon is true. I want to exclaim, that's nice, but it's not enough. We need to feel deep in the inmost parts of our hearts that the Book of Mormon is unequivocally the word of God. We must feel it so deeply that we would never want to live even a single day without it. And so to me, his point is, is, is clear. He's saying, listen, I'm glad you've got a testimony of it. And I'm glad that helps you enter into the covenant. But now what? It's not the end of the road. Once we've entered into that straight, narrow path to quote a certain Nephite prophet, mm. Nephi 31, then what happens then? Um, and that's where, in, in, for, for I'm guessing most of your audience, most of the audience that's listening to this who are probably LDS, um, I don't know, um, but that's where the power of the Book of Mormon continues to play a transformative role in people's lives. Um, so that it's not just powerful for missionaries. It's not just powerful for investigators or those who are studying the gospel. But it has to become powerful to our own daily walk and talk with God. So, so Carrie, you're 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 not you joined the church when you were eight, correct? Yeah, yeah. And yet, the Book of Mormon is powerful to you. Yes, yeah. In fact, I would say, like when you said that uh, you feel like the Book of Mormon is powerful in bringing people. Uh, to to uh, make a covenant and and come to Christ, and you know, for well, I think even before my mission, but for sure on my mission, by the, the time I was done and, you know, I'd read it so many times on my mission, I was convinced I've never sat down and counted, but I'm still absolutely sure I'm right. That if you were to look at the two most common themes, if you're just going to count up how many times a topic was, was mentioned in the Book of Mormon, that the number one most common theme is Christ and his atoning sacrifice. And the second one is, is the covenant. Uh, it's something to, to do with the covenant and the, the role of the house of Israel and so on that gets kind of lost a little bit in the middle, but it's so strong at the beginning. It's so strong in the end and, and it's still there in the middle. So, um, mm -hmm. so it's not surprising to me that we would say that what the book of Mormon is really good about at is helping people. I would say helping people come to God through Christ and covenant. Okay. Um, and, and if, uh, of course that's, that's the starting point. But it's also the enduring to the end process, right? The yes. only way I, I can't think of anything for myself, uh, for my family, for my friends, for ward members. I can't think of anything that I could encourage them to do more than to deepen their relationship with Christ and to stay solid in keeping covenants. And again, that's what the Book of Mormon is all about, right? So uh, it, it gets us there. But I, I if a anyone who's listening Wherever you are, we should be strengthening our relationship with Christ. Well, with God through Christ. Let me put it that way. Yeah, 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 That's yeah, what yeah. we should be doing. That's the there's nothing more important in your life than doing that and in in then keeping covenants and helping other people gather in and keep covenants, right? And that's what the Book of Mormon is all about. Page after yes. page, verse after verse, prophet after prophet. That's the focus. Can we chew on this for a little bit? Because this this is exactly where I felt prompted to go with this. Yeah, uh, you whether you meant to or not are basically quoting directly from the title page, correct? So so let me read this. 
the point of this record is to show unto the remnants of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done to their for their fathers. Yeah, I'm just going to interrupt real quick if it's all right and say I would I, I, this one I'm not quite as sure, but I'm pretty sure the third most common theme I think in the Book of Mormon is remembering, and especially remembering go. what God has done for you. Right, so you've you got go. it right there. That's it. And that next, that they may know the covenants of the Lord, and that next, uh, that they're not cast off forever, that they might have hope, and finally, for the convincing of the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is Christ, the eternal God. So you've got, you've got, and of course Joseph taught that that title page was not his writing, that that was yeah. on that was on the last leaf on the left side, and and and, yeah. and and most have assumed that that means that it was Moroni who wrote it, which is likely. Though some scholars late, lately have been looking and saying, eh, I actually think Mormon got the first part and then Moroni jumped on to the end. And, and we don't know, but one way or the other, it's one of those two. But think about this. One of the things that sets the Book of Mormon apart, I, I, lo I, I love all scratch. Like I, I mentioned, I love the Pearl Great Price. It is thick and rich and gorgeous. Um, and, and I love my Bible. I was born and raised. I came to know Christ through that. Um, and of course, the restoration scripture of the Doctrine and Covenants. But one of the things that sets the Book of Mormon apart is the compiler slash editor slash abridger, however we want to refer to right. Mormon and Moroni. Yeah. They were very purposeful. Yeah. They were selecting material that was with a specific purpose. Um, and they knew who they were writing to. There's, there's a reason why this book is so powerful for us in our day. We all know what Mormon eight 34 through 35, where, where Mormon says, listen, well, here. Okay, if I read? Yeah, please do. Behold, We like people to get into the scriptures on this podcast. So let's Good. do it. Mormon 8, verses 34 through 35. Behold, the Lord has shown unto me. Uh, this is Moroni speaking, by the way, in the Book of mm -hmm. Mormon. In the Book of yeah. Mormon. Um, Behold, the Lord has shown unto me great and marvelous things concerning that which must shortly come at that day when these things shall come forth among you. So it's talking about after it comes forth through Joseph Smith in Numbers 35. Behold, I speak unto you as if you were present, and yet you are not. But behold, Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know your doings. Mm -hmm. I often, when I'm teaching the Book of Mormon, uh, I, I get that opportunity sometimes at BYU also. I'll ask my students, what do you think you were doing when he was spying on you? Because he was looking. He was seeing what our day and age was like, and he was incorporating things in for that purpose. And and you've got you got President Benson who was emphatic about this yeah. concept that the that the Nephites didn't have the record, uh, the Lamanites didn't have the record. It was written explicitly for our day. Now I don't know. I'm I'm positive that the Nephites and the Lamanites had the teachings from the book, but at least uh, well, President Benson is is explicit in this, and he says this. If they, Mormon Moroni, if they saw our day and chose those things which would be of greatest worth to us, is not that how we should study the Book of Mormon? Um, and so you've got this, you've got this scriptural record that is explicitly put together by people who knew us, knew our trials, knew what the challenges and, and opportunities of our day would be. And they compiled a record, abridged a record, put it together in such a way as to help us deal with those challenges. Uh, no wonder it's got such power to help us. Yeah. yeah. Amen to that. So now you also brought up something else that just moves my soul. So if it's okay, I want to key on that a little bit. Yeah. The relationship between the Book of Mormon and Christ. So, 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 okay couple things to, to just share a couple couple quick comments from president nelson and elder holland um and then my own kind of take on that um president nelson said this uh and by the way i should give sources on this uh the uh november conference 2017 do you remember his talk the book of mormon what would your life be like without it oh would i recommend your readers read reread reread and reread that talk but in it he said this the Book of Mormon provides the fullest and most authoritative understanding of the atonement of Jesus Christ to be found anywhere. Yes. And, and there's some rich 
material in the Bible, in the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of the Great Price about that, but nowhere teaches the clarity of the atonement like <laughs> the Book of Mormon does. Yeah. Um, in fact, maybe I'll just piggyback on that and please. say, you know, as I teach, I teach mostly scripture courses, right? And uh, and I try and stay faithful, or we're going to stay faithful to the text, and we'll talk about what the text is talking about. Yeah. So I actually end up teaching about the atonement more when I'm teaching Old Testament than I do when I teach the Gospels, because the Gospels is only just right at, towards the end that you're talking about the atonement, right? You've got a lot of good exemplar stuff, healing, faith, miracles, all these kinds of things. But the Old Testament, you've got tons of things pointing towards the atonement of Christ. And so we end up talking about it more in the Old Testament than in the in the um, Gospels. And and I, I the the second half of the New Testament has quite a bit about the atonement, like, I mean, uh, quite a bit, right? But I still think I end up doing it more, like the word atonement is used more in the book of Leviticus than everywhere else put together. Yep. But there's no book that I end up talking about it as much as the Book of Mormon, because if you're just going to be faithful to the topics of the text, which is what I try and do, yeah. that book is going to require that you talk about the atonement again and again and again. And I'm saying it as, in, as if you're tired of it, but you never are tired of it because it's always wonderful. We, we really do understand the atoning sacrifice of Christ better from the Book of Mormon than from anywhere else. I, I mean, just amen and uh, exclamation point and stamp and everything else on that statement. So true. I, I, Elder Holland gave a talk. Oh, we can uh, say President Holland now. So, yeah. Oh, excuse me. President yeah. Holland gave a talk that moved my soul, and I've used it in classes in the MTC again and again and again. Because he makes the connection. He makes the connection between the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, and Christ uh, in, a, in a beautiful way. It's a, it's, a, it's a couple paragraphs. Is it okay if I read that? Please do. Please do. So this is Elder Holland's words, not mine. He said, now, with the advantage that nearly 60 years gives me since I was a newly believing 14-year-old. So he's about 74 at this point. I declare some things I know. I know that God is at all times and in all ways and in all circumstances a loving, forgiving Father in heaven. I know Jesus was his only perfect child, whose life was given lovingly by the will of both the Father and the Son for the redemption of all the rest of us who are not perfect. I know he rose from the dead, from that death to live again. And because he did, you and I will also. And then this, I know that Joseph Smith, who acknowledged that he wasn't perfect, was nevertheless the chosen instrument of God in God's hand to restore the everlasting gospel to the earth. Now listen, here's, your, here's the crux. I also know that in doing so, particularly through translating the Book of Mormon, he has taught me more of God's love of Christ's divinity and of priesthood power than any other prophet of whom I have ever read, known, or heard in a lifetime of seeking. Mm -hmm. Now think about Elder President Holland's knowledge. This is a this is an incredibly well-read PhD um, apostle. Yeah. But in all that he's read and every prophet he has heard and listened and studied, none have helped him come closer to Christ more so than Joseph Smith, particularly through the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And, and I, I could say the same thing. That's that's exactly where I was gonna go. Talk. What what do you mean? Yeah, I, I mean I've 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 read all sorts of things. I'm interested in other religious beliefs. I've studied, uh, you know, the scriptures pretty extensively. Um and uh, all sorts of other things. I I mean I, I Elder Holland or President Holland is probably, I'm sure he's more well read than I am, but I've, I've read a bit and uh, and nothing has helped me understand the atoning sacrifice of Christ like the Book of Mormon. I would say in some ways, um, in many ways, my understanding of the gospel uh, has been well formed by by Elder Maxwell. He had a huge influence on my understanding yeah. of the gospel uh, as I was just graduating from high school and 
then uh, going on my mission and starting college as when of like not my will but thine and but for a small moment and all those wonderful amazing books that he wrote okay. um and that certainly has helped me understand the atoning sacrifice of christ but not even a smidgen compared to the book of mormon uh that is how i know a a about the fall my understanding of the fall and the atonement comes from the book of mormon Yes. And I think I, I think I just, uh, I may have said this on a different podcast uh, episode just recently. I can't remember. I've been real here as yeah. we're hitting Christmas break. I'm recording a lot. So uh, I can't remember what I've said where, but uh, I just recently last weekend was doing a, a workshop on the Book of Mormon and um, we wanted to talk about the fall. Oh, yeah, I know this. Uh, anyway, this is one I recorded this morning and it will come out. Anyway, I, I said a little bit of this already, but um uh, I just wanted to talk about what are the unique teachings of the Book of Mormon on the fall and the atonement. Well, we never got to the atonement part because after like the hour and a half we'd set aside for it, we'd uh, we'd barely touched talking about the fall. And of course, you end up talking about the atonement of Christ if you're going to talk about the fall. Of course, they're so interrelated, you can't not do both. But there is so much rich, deep thing, uh, understanding of the fall and of Christ's atoning sacrifice that is unique to us as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because of the Book of Mormon. It's just so powerful. So rich. So and, rich. and in fact, maybe I'll tie in one other thing with that, if it's OK, because oh. I, I keyed in on this when you were uh, reading the title page. And I don't know why I didn't think of this either. I did just uh, yesterday and this won't come out until like mid uh, February to late February. So these are all like little teasers for my audience, I guess. But uh, I interviewed uh, Dan Debenham, who uh, he's the guy who stars in and produces um, Relative Race, if you've ever seen that mm -hmm. show. Yeah. Uh, and part of what we were talking about was this idea that sometimes we feel cast off or we feel cut off or abandoned. And, uh, you know, that the, the people in relative race feel that way. But for me, it's a kind of a mirror of how we feel about like we're cut off from the father and we need to be reunited with our father. Uh, and I wish I would have read that title page thing. Right. Because that's the, the point of the Book of Mormon is to help us not feel cast off, which is the the, the stuff when we're going through with the fall. That's how Lehi describes it, that that the fall makes it so that we're cast off or we're cut off and that we're lost. And that that idea of being cut off or cast off is so integrally tied with the fall. But it's also tied with the loss of covenant. When you don't keep the covenant, then you're cast off or cut off. And and uh, that's that's like a second fall. Almost. I think the Book of Mormon is teaching us you're cut off by falling. Then you can regain God's presence to a degree uh, as soon as you make the covenant, you have a member of the, the Godhead be, become your constant companion. You have some degree of being reunited with God. And then if you don't keep the covenant, then you fall again. You're cut off from his presence again. And so those, it's not a coincidence that those phrases are used for both the fall and not keeping the covenant. And so I think it's so fantastic that there it is in the title page. This isn't you. You're not cut off either because you think the covenants aren't being fulfilled or you're not cut off because of the fall. In fact, the covenants are going to be fulfilled. And just like they were for our fathers, they're going to be fulfilled for you. And that's Moroni talking to us in our day, right? Or Mormon right. talking to us in our day. And that's going to happen through Christ. Hallelujah for that, right? Hallelujah. Exactly. That's why, that's why I kind of wanted to bifurcate a little bit here i wanted to talk about how the book of mormon brings people into the covenant but it's such a powerful source to help keep us on the covenant path connected to christ moving forward i yeah. i hope I it was... keeps us hurtling down that covenant <laughs> path right we want to yes. be we want to be just increasing our spiritual men momentum we could say our spiritual momentum in the covenant path towards god that's what yes. we want and that's what yeah. the book of mormon well the spirit that comes we should emphasize that it's really the the, the, the holy ghost that right. comes to teach and edify as you're reading the book of mormon Gary, you just keep grabbing what i'm going to next because that's yeah. the point i wanted to make that's beautiful that that means kind of the spirit's guiding here uh, um, yeah, before yeah. going to before going to that though i I was taught to love Jesus Christ and believe he was my savior by my angel mother uh, when I was just a wee little lad. Um, and so I didn't get converted to Christ through the church or through the Book of Mormon. I, I already knew that. And though I can't say my life, uh, how do I say this? I can't say my life necessarily reflected that. I felt it deeply. Um and so I 
come to the church, I come to the Book of Mormon with a love of Christ and a desire to be close to Christ that came from my wonderful Christian upbringing in the Lutheran church and in a few born again Christian churches and through my mom. But I look at my life and what happened when the Book of Mormon entered in and my connection to the Savior. And without naysaying any of the beautiful things I'd received as a child and that I received in my other experiences in other churches, which laid the foundation for everything that I love and and and, and value now. When the Book of Mormon entered, and that became that became the touchstone. Like many Latter Day Saints, I read it again and again and again and again and again and again, and I read it privately. I read it with my family, my my sweetheart, and I read it every day um, together. It's part of our our gospel study. I I read it in Thai, where I was a mission president. She reads it in Finnish. That's her native language, and we go back and forth every day. So so. The experience I've had since coming into that covenant is that not only do I believe in Christ and not only do I want to be close to Christ, the Book of Mormon teaches me how to do that. Mm. Uh, and, and I'm not, again, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not saying that there's not beautiful truths in that vein in the Bible. I understand. Yeah, my, my relationship with the Savior is so much more real and rich because of the truths that I have learned in and of the Book of Mormon. So when, when Elder Holland made that statement and, and President Nelson made that statement, I'm thinking, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I want to, to help people see and help our students, help my children, help myself as I continue to go forward, right? Yes. Um, now, you brought up uh, kind of towards the latter part of what I was thinking. Scripture isn't magic, yeah. It's not there's not magic ink on white paper that all of a sudden read it and you're churchy. Um, and so one of the things I like to point out to my students is it's not that you're going to grow closer to God by reading the Book of Mormon. That is not what Joseph said. His exact words, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on the earth and the keystone of our religion. And then listen to this. And a man would get near to God by abiding by its precepts yep. by any other book. Yep. We often miss, not we, hopefully, but in the church, we often misquote that. And well, if I read the Book of Mormon, I'll grow closer to God. Well, possibly, are you going to do something about what you read? And so one of the things that I, I teach, like you, I, 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 I love teaching the scriptures. I teach because I teach a lot of marriage and family and 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 mission prep and things. I have some classes that I teach that aren't just wholly scripture based. Right. But at BYU, I've taught the Book of Mormon, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price. So, so as I'm teaching these things, I want my students to realize the power of the Word of God comes when the Holy Spirit is invited into our life because of what we learn and what we feel um, as we're studying his word, Book of Mormon, Dr. Cummins, whatever it is, that then that Holy Spirit guides us in how we're going to change our lives. Uh, we're not interested in just being kind of philosophical sophisticates where we, we know a lot about God. That's not what God wants. He wants us to become as he is. That happens as the Holy Spirit guides us. And it doesn't happen by simply thinking deep thoughts. It happens as I gird up my loins and fresh courage take and humble myself and, and change where I am today and become a little better tomorrow. Well, that happens as I drink deeply from the scriptures, um, which then allows me to experience the Holy Spirit more powerfully which then, well, think about this. This this is the doctrine of Christ. We, we, we often talk about the doctrine of Christ, but we call it typically the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. Faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. But that's what the Book of Mormon teaches is the doctrine of Christ. That's what we're seeking to do. We're, we, we need to have faith in Christ. If we have faith in Christ... It will lead us to want to be better and do better. We call that repentance. Mm. As we repent, 
It leads us to make and keep covenants with God. Oh, wait, that's baptism. That's the temple. That's that's the ordinances of the priesthood. When we do that, we invite the Holy Spirit more richly into our life, which then increases our faith in Christ, which helps us to repent better, which helps us to keep our covenants better, which invites more of the Spirit. And it's this beautiful helix that all of a sudden the gospel isn't simply ho-hum. It's powerful and passionate. It has nothing to do with personality. It, it, it's not, It's not. oh my goodness, I'm an excitable person. It's I'm growing closer to God. I'm growing the Father and to the Son as a result of my faith in Christ and drawing near by abiding by the precepts of the book and making and keeping my covenants and experiencing the Holy Spirit, which just continues to build upon itself. Amen. Amen. And that's that's what we want. We hope that, uh, you know, President Nelson, I mean, uh, Oaks has spoken a lot of times about the the need for scripture to bring the Holy Ghost into our lives, to, to change us, to help us, to guide us what among those or how to proceed along those things you're talking about and to change us. And so we'll, we'll throw that in as well, right? I mean, it's just such a wonderful thing. I am so excited for this Book of Mormon year. I think, uh, I believe that if we, well, I'll put it this way. I think that the church has really that the come follow me program in the church has had a big effect on us as saints i think we are more into the scriptures now than ever more unified about being into the scriptures than ever and there's a power that's flowing into our lives as a result for those who are really doing it for those who aren't really in the scriptures and i think we're in that sifting period right and president nelson said if you don't have the spirit with you you're not going to survive spiritually well no better way to have the spirit with you than praying and reading the scriptures and going to the church and attending the temple but um the uh we're in that sifting process and those who are really as we're energized about the come follow me program we're we're leveling up as it were in <laughs> in uh uh, our relationship with God and in our <laughs> spiritual power. And uh, so that's been a fantastic thing. We're what now on uh, just finishing our, our fifth year, about to start our sixth year of doing Come Follow Me, I think. But I think our uh, we were just getting good at it last time we did Book of Mormon. I think yeah. as a church, we're, we're getting uh, membership of the church. Yeah. We're getting really good at doing Come Follow Me now. I think this is going to be a powerful year. It's going to be a fantastic year. And I'm, I'm looking forward to us all coming to understand the gospel better and coming closer to God through Christ and keeping our covenants better because that's what the Book of Mormon is really good at helping it us does. do. And the promises are so rich. I mean, one yeah. of the things I do with my missionaries in the MTC is, is sometimes we'll just do a little survey. What have prophets promised? Oh, wow. <laughs> if you use the Book of Mormon. And and I mean, there's dozens and dozens of, of them. Two that I, I really like, one from President uh, Hinckley and one from President Nelson, just kind of sum it up to me. President Hinckley said this, without reservation, I promise you that if you will prayerfully read the Book of Mormon, notice the, the qualifier there. Yeah. Simply go through the motions. Prayerfully read the Book of Mormon, regardless of how many times you've previously read it. There will come into your hearts an added measure of the Spirit of the Lord. There will come a strengthened resolution to walk in obedience to his commandments, to abide by its precepts. And there will come a stronger testimony of the living reality of the son of God. Well, yeah. that's, that's, that's the story. And then president Nelson, my dear brothers and sisters, I promise that as you prayerfully study the book of Mormon, there's that qualifier again, every day you will make better decisions every day. I promise that as you ponder what you study, the windows of heaven will open and you will receive answers to your own questions and direction for your own life. I promise, this is a prophet's promise. I promise that as you daily immerse yourself in the Book of Mormon, you can be immunized against the evils of the day, even the grip, gripping plague. And then he starts talking about pornography and other addictions and things. But the promises are so powerful and so consistent from Joseph Smith all the way through President Nelson. Prophets are pleading with us to dive into the Book of Mormon, not because we worship the Book of Mormon, not because it's magic, right. but because of his power to help us know we're not cast off, to help us know of the covenants of God, to help us connect to Jesus Christ. 
So that's that's my that's been my personal experience. My my entire everything I value, everything I love, all that matters most to me. I can point back and say, well, that's come because of that Book of Mormon, which after my missionaries dumped me, <laughs> was the thing that brought me back. And since then, for the last 40, 41 years that I've been a member of the church has been the thing that has kept me strongly bound, covenant bound to the Savior. So like you, I'm excited for this coming year as we study the Book of Mormon. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just really grateful for uh, this opportunity to talk about the Book of Mormon together. And I, I've been uplifted. I hope that uh, our audience has been uplifted. I'm, I'm sure you have been and uh, that you'll share this with others. I mean, tell people about it and share it through the ways you can share things online and like and rate and review and comment and download and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but just let people know about it. Uh, I'll also just let our audience know that I'm very excited for uh, next week. Uh, as we actually get into the text of the Book of Mormon. And so uh, Noel Reynolds, uh, many of you may have heard of Noel Reynolds. If not, uh, you're in for a treat. What a great scholar and great man. Um, he is going to uh, just go through, we're just going to get through First Nephi 1-1 together. That's what he and I are going to talk about together. And then uh, my sometimes co-host Lamar and I are going to jump into to uh, First Nephi 1 through 5 together. So there's some great things to look forward to next week as well. We hope you'll uh, join us then and that you'll let other people to know to join us. So, But uh, this week we've been so well fed. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you. Happy to be here with you. <laughs>